Catholic versus Orthodox. I'll be honest with you guys. Ladies and gentlemen, big shocker. I am neither. They start a conversation and the girl asks the guy, what religion are you? He replies, Christian. She says, me too. That conversation has likely happened millions of times, since there are about 2.6 billion Christians on the planet. On top of that, the Center for the Study of Global Christianity said in 2021 that around the world there's something like 45,000 Christian denominations. Throughout history, there have been splits and more splits, with different churches believing different things. It would be an understatement to say it's complicated. So today, we'll just concentrate on the one great big split and what happened after that. So sometimes people use this as a way to try to, like, discredit Christianity. Like, mm -hmm. oh, there's 45,000 different... Worldwide, there's about 300 in America. Yeah. That's an important distinction. Okay, so it's there's not 45,000 denominations, and a lot of them believe the core doctrines. Yes, a lot of them agree on the essentials. Yeah, they agree on the essentials. Judas Iscariot giving his buddy away in the Garden of Gethsemane. What we mean is the church really started to have some legs, and that's when the problem started. After Jesus Christ died on the cross and was later resurrected, Christianity was right throughout the Roman Empire. Although there was a fair bit of persecution going on, then in the year 313, Emperor Constantine made Christianity legal, and in 380, it became the state religion. The Catholic Church says it began with the teachings of Christ and all its disciples. Those guys spread the word, and today people still spread the word. There are people called bishops, and they're supposed to be like those old school disciples. In part, thanks to them, Christianity was soon everywhere. As the centuries passed, more churches started popping up, although they don't really become pervasive until the 11th century. That's when things really got heated. All you need to know is that Christianity spread over vast areas of the world, but the head guy, the Pope, was in Rome. So the Roman Empire fell 476 AD, but he, th this video is saying that the explosion of churches wasn't until hundreds of years after this. Mm. So this is this whole notion that like the Roman Empire is the reason why Christianity became a staple. It's like Christianity became legalized and then became the religion of the Roman Empire, and then 100 years later, Rome fell. In general, one could say... Rome was recognized, yes, but what primacy meant and in what context differed? The reality is far more complex than simple yes or no. First, because there was no, because there was not a single Eastern church either before the Great Schism. And what do you mean not a single Eastern church? Oh, okay, well, because yeah, they hadn't, they hadn't broken off yet before the Great Schism. Also because how the primacy of Rome was understood in the context of other bishops and other patriarchs, including Pentarchy. Buried among the different churches, both east and west, and changed and developed among them, even with Rome's own view. Very briefly, it is clear, early church history within a generation or two, that Rome has some kind of primacy in other local churches. First in charity and honor is one of the first expressions, circa 100. Apostolic see in general were apostolic sees in general were more important in this period, as were larger, wealthier, and naturally more influential churches. Rome was one of them, right? Rome was a prosperous church, primarily because Constantine came to faith, who was the emperor. Additionally, the particular apostles associated with Rome were the two big, were the, were the big two, P Peter and Paul. Nobody questioned Peter's primacy among the twelve or Paul's primacy as a post-resurrection apostle. On the other hand, a lot of early modern-day attempts to read supremacy or jurisdiction into the primacy of the first few centuries are exaggerated. Hmm, you see that? Basically, they're saying that, yes, Rome had some degree of influence because it was a prosperous church. However, it also, this is being read into their supremacy after the fact mm. by doctrines like papal, papal infallibility. The Pope is infallible. There's nothing like the exercise of authority witness even in the 5th, 10th, 15th, or 20th century present in the 1st or 2nd in each of those moments different from each other. So it sounds like they were, like Rome had a distinct relationship as a church with the other churches, but it, they did not view the Pope as infallible in the way that Catholics view the Pope as infallible today, which papal infallibility didn't come to be a doctrine, I want to say, until the Council of Trent or, yeah, I want to say it was, it was around 1700. It was in response to the Reformation. They started viewing the Pope as infallible in response to Luther, not pre-Luther, which is a huge distinction, mm. right? To say that the Pope's words are infallible in response to Luther, which is 1500. Anyway, sidetrack, go ahead. ...to Rome. They were spread over parts of Europe, parts of Asia, parts of Africa, and the Middle East. Those people were part of Eastern Christianity. But this only refers to geography, not beliefs and customs. Now, you need to understand two words, Catholic and Orthodox. Catholic actually comes from the word universal. So what it really means is universal Christianity. Orthodox mm -hmm. relates to following the correct beliefs. So if you're Orthodox, you think you're just doing things the right way according to tradition and law. Of course, mm -hmm. no religious person is going to say, I'm following the wrong beliefs. 
And no person is going to say my religion is not a universal truth, otherwise it's not really a religion. In this sense, the semantic sense, all Christians are Orthodox and Catholic. But that's We're not all the Catholic, Orthodox, Christian! Get off my back! That's crazy. All of us! I'm a Catholic, Orthodox, uh, Protestant. I'm a Catholic, Orthodox, Protestant. <laughs> Why y'all tripping? Let me have it, right? Part of the universal church. Now, I'm not a Roman Catholic. I follow the But I've been beliefs. to Rome. Oh. And I've been to the Vatican. It's a vibe. And you're a man. And I'm a man. I've been to Rome and you're a man. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of Roman. Roman. Go ahead. Roman, Orthodox, Catholic, Protestant. I think that Roman is a distinct. Roman Catholic is a distinction. Mm. Right. Point of the show. Now we come to the big split, aka the East West Schism. This officially happened in 1054 and was the result of Eastern and Western Christianity often not getting along politically and having different opinions on how one should serve Christ. One historian speaking in academic parlance described the reason for the split like this the depths of intellectual alienation that had developed between the two sections of Christendom. They had their differences and they broke up. Nowadays, the Eastern Orthodox Church is the second biggest church after the Roman Catholic Church. The Pope is not their leader. Instead, each different Orthodox Church has a head bishop who is elected by all the other bishops in that church, and he becomes the Patriarch or what's called the Holy Synod. There isn't just one, though, in all Orthodox Christianity. For instance, you have the Russian Holy Synod, the Greek Holy Synod, the Romanian Holy Synod, and more. I don't like that they left out the Oriental Orthodox Church. That's a big chunk. That's mm. Ethiopian, Armenian, I want to say Coptic. I want to say all the non-white ones. You gotta I include say that one. Assyrian, yeah. So they're really just talking about the Eastern Orthodox, but there was a split way before this, 400 years before this. So there's been quite a few schisms. So it's interesting that they kind of defined about that, but that is correct. They all are like archbishops versus Catholics just have basically the archbishop of, of Rome, who's the pope, but there's multiple folks in the Eastern Orthodox. Set the metaphorical throne and answers to no one. You also have the Patriarch of Constantinople on Orthodox Christianity, who is kind of the spiritual number one and the first among equals. But he's not mm -hmm. like the Pope in that he doesn't hold sway over all the other patriarchs around the world. He still holds a lot of respect, but then Russia has its own spiritual top man in the Archbishop of Moscow. In matters of doctrine, the Roman Pope is said to be infallible, meaning he doesn't get anything wrong. The Orthodox Church disagrees, <laughs> saying even its own leaders can That's make crazy. mistakes. Those leaders, by the way, are usually ordained monks before they become patriarch. Orthodox Christians are usually okay with priests being celibate or not being celibate, while Catholics don't allow priests to have intimate partners. Celibacy is not a big deal for most Orthodox churches. The difference is not really a great issue. A really big difference, and the reason for centuries. The, by the way, the the need to make priests celibate in the Catholic Church wasn't until this schism. It was about a thousand. Prior to that, Catholic priests could be married. Wow. Yeah. So. It really made that jump from Catholic to Orthodox easier. Mm hmm. <laughs> They're like, yeah. which one are you going to be? Yeah, which one are you going to be? Go ahead, oh, uh, by the way. The one I can have a wife. <laughs> oh, by the way. <laughs> That's talking about the Holy Trinity, which is the Holy Spirit, the Father, and the Son. The disagreement over this has been called the Filioqua Fracas, with Filioqua relating to the Son. It was actually one of the biggest reasons for the Great Breakup. You see, those guys in the East said it was the Father and the Father alone that was behind the Holy Spirit, and the Son wasn't so involved. They even said, if you think any different, you're a heretic. Swords Whoa. were drawn, and they were Whoa. never sheathed. Still today, the Son and the Orthodox Church won't play such a starring role in preceding the Holy Spirit. They say the Western Church shoehorned the Son into things by itself, and that just wasn't right. They preferred what they think is the original version of events told by the first theologians, the Church Fathers. Still, both churches agree that there is a Father up in heaven and a Son that came down to earth, and also a Holy Spirit that is everywhere. They just don't agree on the relationship they have. Okay, but why do they disagree? Didn't Jesus say, I'm going to send the Helper? Right? I thought Jesus said, Who I'm going to send the saying doesn't emphasize the Son? So the the, it sounds like the Orthodox are saying, Oh. The Father alone sent the, the Spirit. Mm. And the Catholics, which we Protestants come out of Catholicism, yeah. are saying that the Son is a part of sending the Holy Spirit. Wow. If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. Huh, that's interesting. The Spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you before long the world will. So here Jesus is saying, I will ask the Father, and the Father will send the Holy Spirit. And then he says, I will send you the helper from the Father. The helper is the Spirit of truth who comes from the Father. When he comes, he will be. Okay. When the advocate so both. comes, so they're I, both right. I will send you to send to you from the Father the Spirit of Truth. What are we fighting over? You know the Trinity's real. What are we fighting over? Jesus is God. One, Je one Jesus never claimed says, to be God. Yeah, one verse <laughs> says the Father. I will ask the Father to send you the Spirit. The very next chapter, he says, I will send, send you the Spirit. Spirit. Yeah. 
And why do people today still argue for their side? Let's face it, it's human nature to join a club and support it. And where you're born usually determines which club you'll be supporting. Now you'll see how each club has different ways of doing things, not just thinking things. You're likely wondering what this seemingly intractable rupture means today. If you mention the sun preceding the Holy Spirit in, say, Russia or Bulgaria, are you liable to find yourself in a punch-up? We doubt it, but both sides do argue over certain things. For instance, you might have seen Catholics making the sign of the cross on themselves, such as soccer players before they take a penalty kick or mobsters when they're just narrowly escaped a whacking. You'll notice that they make the beam of the cross from the left shoulder to the right shoulder. Orthodox Christians do it the other way around. It might seem like a small deal, but it isn't for some who believe they do it the correct way. We visited an Eastern Orthodox website to find out why there's a difference. This is what we read. They, Catholics, must explain why they've changed an ancient and apostolic tradition. We cannot answer as to their motivations. Hmm. Yet again, the Roman Catholic Church gets called out for doing things its own way and not adhering to old school thought and methods. The Orthodox Church says it's preserved traditions etched in stone. It pays more attention, or most people do, to rituals. If you're going to try and preserve traditions, then you really have to be strict about your rituals. Religion mm. is, by its very nature, conservative. But one mm. of the bigger differences is the Orthodox Church is usually more conservative than the Catholic mm -hmm. Church. To give you an example. Imagine the Catholic, like from the Protestant perspective, mm -hmm. the Catholic Church being the more new school yeah. uh, uh, version is like hilarious to and us. <laughs> I remember when I became a Protestant, I asked my Armenian apostolic, Derkhaer, and he said, the word of God and the tradition of the church. You got to maintain those two. You know, so they they really view that as as a, as a huge 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 important thing. Go ahead. Example, we looked at Pew research studies on orthodox feelings about homosexuality and same sex marriage. In the majority of countries that are home to mostly Orthodox Christians, the vast majority of people were against both. Greece was the only country where a quite large but not very large percentage of people said homosexuality should be accepted by society. The Catholic Church also calls homosexuality a sin, but there are still progressive elements within the church, more so mm -hmm. than the Orthodox Church. Just to give you an idea of how a certain church might think, one person wrote to a Greek Orthodox Church in the US. His question was, I am powerfully drawn to the Orthodox Church, but I'm gay. He asked if he could still join. The answer was kind of yes, with some <laughs> caveats, such as this. A repentant, struggling homosexual who refrains from homosexual acts can be received into the church after the usual course of instruction, but he or she would do their best to keep this matter in the confessional, just as is common with every other sin. Of course, all mm. people are different. We like this response we found on another website when someone asked which church was more conservative. Politically, mm. Orthodox and Catholic Christians are both all over the map. You'll find Orthodox communists and Orthodox neo-fascists, but also Orthodox peaceniks and the like. Same goes for Catholics. Still, some things are just different and they'll always be. Take Easter, for example, which for many people will be how this deceased American comedian explained it. Commemorating the, the death and resurrection of Jesus by telling our children a giant bunny rabbit left chocolate eggs at night. He was actually referring to Catholics or Protestants and not members of the Orthodox Church. They are dead serious when it comes to the resurrection. In both churches, Easter can fall on different days of the year, but the right. days will still be different for both churches. The reason mm -hmm. is because of a man named Pope Gregory the Thirteenth. In 1582, he made a change to the calendar, and that's why when you look at your phone, you're looking at the Gregorian calendar. The Orthodox mm -hmm. Church bases the days of Easter on the Julian calendar, which mm -hmm. relates to Julius Caesar. Again, they are sticking with tradition since Julian calendar preceded the Gregorian calendar. They're also a lot stricter about Easter. They start fasting on Clean Monday and do it for 40 days until it ends on Lazarus Saturday, eight days before Easter. This fasting period is called the Great Lent. When that's mm -hmm. over, they might chow down on roasted lamb or traditional soups and cakes, but not so much on the sickly sweet Cadbury cream eggs that were hidden in pairs of running shoes. The fasting part for Orthodox Christians is a huge deal since it relates to important matters such as purification, enlightening yourself, and liberating yourself from sin. In short, it shows a certain amount of dedication. Catholics may fast too, but only on Ash Wednesday, Good Friday, and other Fridays during Lent. The truth is, Catholics are more likely not to follow fasting rules than Orthodox folks. As a matter of fact, members of the Orthodox Church are supposed to fast every Wednesday and Friday throughout the year, and many will take this seriously. Catholics should also fast every Friday, but many or most don't. As for what fasting Dang, every Friday? Catholics are supposed to fast every Friday, bro? You know they're not doing that. Catholics, where y'all at, man? Tap Come in. Why you aren't you fasting every Friday, my G? What are you fasting from? Come on now. Some people are stricter than others. It often means one meal a day with no meat, plus... And is Orthodox a, is supposed is to fast every they Wednesday, Wednesday Friday? Orthodox. Oh, yeah, they misspelled. Shout out, hey, shout out to Infographics, man. You know, they be misspelling they're, stuff. They're too. human. They're human. They're sinners. They're not infallible like the Pope. <laughs> you might lay off the dairy and booze, among other things. For some Catholics, it might mean staying off Facebook for the day. The meaning of Easter for both churches is a bit different, too. In both cases, Christ was crucified and then resurrected, but the Catholics put great emphasis on J.C. suffering for our sins. And that's why he's usually depicted covered in blood. There's no blood in Orthodox renditions. For the Orthodox Church, the emphasis of the resurrection is more about Christ's victory, his triumph over dark forces. If Catholics see it as Jesus taking a hit for our sins, which is a bit depressing in a way, the Orthodox folks see it as Jesus kicking some butt. This might I like seem that. I like the Christ victory. 
That's yeah. hard. Like a small difference, but it's not when it comes to celebrations. For the Orthodox Church, Easter is like celebrating D-Day, but for the Catholics it's more like shamefully looking up and saying, thanks dude for having my back. There are some other differences, big and small. A small one might be that people of the Orthodox Church are more likely to stand up while praying. It's not demanded by any means, but it happens more. Again, it's mm. down to the interpretation of God's word and reverence to God. That is not a big deal. But what is a serious matter is what happens after death. In the Orthodox Church, there is no such thing as that halfway house called Shut purgatory. Up. The church also doesn't have indulgences. Those are things that Catholics could exploit to pay their way out of going to hell. Why? Hmm. Well, again, they say these things were made up and not part of the original scripts. To them, the difference is important. In 2007, the Serbian Orthodox Church talked about a few small reforms, such as speaking a traditionally silent prayer. It sounds like nothing, but people went to the streets protesting. One person held off a sign that read, Don't turn us into Roman Catholics. You can equally imagine a more modern-thinking Roman Catholic and Orthodox Christian meeting in a bar and one of them saying, Remind me again, why am I supposed to not like you? The other just shrugs and says, Because your parents said so. No doubt, hmm. we will take a beating for our flagrant simplicity regarding this complex and, for some people, very serious matter. However generalizing we've been, we've at least clumsily tried to cover some basics. Time to duck for cover. I'm going to say this. <laughs> if I had to choose, I think the, the Orthodox is more consistent. If you're going to prioritize tradition, stick to the tradition. You can't didn't change tradition every couple hundred years. Right? You can't be like, uh, priests can't have wives. Priests, priests can't have wives. No, they can't. Yeah, not uh, you know, there's, there's a respect amongst all the uh, bishops. Uh, nope. Pope's infallible. Like you can't, you can't just keep changing traditions and be like we're about tradition. I, I also don't rock with the purgatory thing. So I, if I had to be honest, I would say the orthodox position is substantially, substantially more consistent with church history, with the way they view the resurrection. Yeah, and and, and then being overall more conservative. Now, my idea is that everyone is crafted in, including the Protestants, and so there for that reason, I'm extremely excited to have Jonathan Pajot coming on the podcast, because I'm excited to have this conversation with the I've had Trent Horn on, and I'm going to have Jonathan Pajot on. Trent Horn's Catholic friend of mine, Jonathan Pajot, is coming on. He is going to be kind of presenting the Orthodox perspective. And then I got to get an Oriental Orthodox on um, to complete the whole the whole gamut. So I'm uh, excited to, to have these sorts of conversations with people in these circles. We see, according to the Bible, that prayer is extremely important in terms of us being transformed from the inside out when we get aligned with God's will. For the Christians watching this channel, I want you guys to implement these spiritual disciplines in your day-to-day -day life. And the only way I've been able to do this consistently is through writing down my prayers in a prayer journal that does a few things. One, it allows me to reflect and come to God humbly and ask him to move on my behalf. And two, it allows me to document my prayers, which ultimately helped me remember the very things that I was praying for and see the hand of God tangibly in my life when he answers them. So I would urge you, consider writing down your prayers. It could be in a blank notebook. It could even be on your phone. Or you could check out the one I personally designed and used from my own quiet time and spiritual discipline that I think will be a huge blessing. It's the exact structure and system that I've used for years to pray and be more consistent in my spiritual disciplines. You can pick yours up today by clicking the link in the pinned comment below. All right, I'll see you over there. Peace.